Okay. Uh, thanks for being there for presentation. So my name is Emilien Lejamtel. Uh, I'm working for CERTU as a security analyst, and I'm here with Johanna. Hello, I'm uh, Johanna. I work as a security administrator for uh, CERTU. Okay, so you already had a presentation from CERTU yesterday from SAD, so we will not introduce any more. <laughs> Okay, so this talk is about not blockchain uh, technology directly, um, even if it's slightly related, uh, but it's about containers. And what I would like to say as an introduction is that's something we started six months ago. So we're with Johanna in Amsterdam, and we're preparing a presentation about crypto uh, currency attack. And then we found out this weird Docker server with a base 64 encoded uh, script which was kind of downloading of the stuff, say, what the hell is this thing? And we say, okay, we'd like to investigate more. So that all we end up uh, with uh, this topic today and that's where we end up here. So what we try to achieve and what we will speak about today is exactly how easy it is to compromise containers technology, especially Docker and Kubernetes. And we'd like to identify what we can see in the wild to kind of reproduce it, to assess how big it is, and at the end, us as the third, we need to be able to protect our constituents against uh, similar attacks that we observe in the wild. And so we did a lot of work to actually understand how the attack works, what we can do to protect, and especially what we can do to detect it. So this presentation will be in four parts. The first part will be about some kind of quick explanation on container technology and security. Then I will speak, uh, then we will speak about uh, attacks against such technology and what we can see uh, actually being exploited online. And finally, we will speak about detection. Yep. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay, we will talk a bit, not too much, about like uh, Docker ar architecture for the person, maybe there are some people who are not really familiar with it. Um, we have basically the um, Docker environment works um, as a server, uh, as a client server application. So you have a daemon, which is actually operating with the operating, it's interacting with the operating system and powers on the containers, run the images and so on. And then you have also the containers, which are in the host and also the images. So basically the, uh, the whole thing will put in, in place a um, working container based on the images that you have. Of course, you have to take those ones from uh, somewhere, so you'll have to go to the registry to uh, pull them from there. Okay, so initially, how do you how do you uh, build uh, build an image? So you have a Docker file where you put everything that you need on it, like what um, application you need, what you need to install on it. You build it, and you building it into an image, and then you use this image. Uh, to run a container. Well, you have more ways of doing it, but nowadays you will see that most of the time you build the image, you will push the image to a um, Docker registry hub, and then people will just pull that image and just install it. You put it there and uh, it should be ready. Okay, now, when you, uh, you as a, as a person who wants uh, to pull an image from somewhere, you have to think at, um, it's, it's really important that to think, is that, uh, image trusted? Do I take it like, is it sign, it is a signed image or is just like somewhere, someone there just put it there to, I don't know, do some uh, malicious, uh, malicious stuff. Also, you have to think from where I'm pulling the image. Is it the communication secure? Is it, uh, encrypted, like when I'm pulling the image, it, can someone sniff it or not? When I'm talking about being properly built, well, properly built means like, did you um, made, build the image in such a way that you run it as root? Well, if you need to run it, only if you need to run it as root, you do it like this, but if you need, I don't know, just normal privileges, don't just put your root there because you'll see further, it's uh, it's not good for your environment. Also, really, really important, don't put anything that might uh, be able, like, give the chance for the others to um, take your, like, data. You have 
don't put passwords there. This is a really, really bad uh, practice. Okay, now when you're coming to, okay, we have the image and then we have the container. So let's say we got to the, to the point, we pulled out the image, we're sure that everything is secure and everything is uh, as it's supposed to be, but then do you know if the uh, container is up to date? You have to uh, do um, regularly um, security scanning, uh, check for vulnerabilities, and and see if it's uh, if it's uh, on the uh, newest updates and so on. It's really important to know how it ru who runs it and with what privileges. Like as I said before, if you don't need to be like a super user, then just use it with normal ones. And if you don't you need extra privileges, just, just don't put it there. Like you, you for example, normally um, containers sh should run as um, only a, as read only. You shouldn't be able to modify it. So don't run it as like privilege. This won't, um, this will give chances to the others to get into your system and um, again, get your data, which for sure you don't want to. When I'm talking also about a security in place, do you have um, sec security on the, you know, that containers, they run on the, um, in an environment where they are limited as, as resources and limited as, um, um, res uh, as um, processes. So you, you're like, somehow you have boundaries, but when it comes to the um, s system calls, what, what about those? You you should be able to give only access to um, the persons only who need it. So I strongly suggest that you should be able to um, uh, enable security um, seccomp, which seccomp profiles, which will make you um, much more secure, will reduce the attack um, uh, space kernel. Okay, this is like, you can find all the details. There are like pretty good uh, best practices out there on the CIS benchmark. So they have a pretty well structured uh, um, ideas on how to do it. Okay, now we're coming to the most important part of um, of like uh, the Docker environment, the Docker demo, or maybe we could call it like the Docker engine. Well, it's the one which deals with all the um, um, system calls and which makes like your container to to run in your environment. So there is though there are some um, this uh, demo can work with the um, CLI, but also it can um, listen for REST APIs, which uh, we have it in on port 2375 and 2376. But if you let it like insecure, everyone can log in. So if you'll ever need it to uh, uh, like to enable it, make sure that you have a secure communication. It's really, it's really important. So enable TLS authentication and you have less chances that people will get into your environment. Also, one really important thing, if you want to look into your um, infrastructure and see what's happening, to see all the remote API calls, enable the log level to debug it. If you, if you don't do it, you won't be able to see much information. You will see further in the presentation. And what is really important to give access only to the trust, trusted user as uh, Docker runs as a, um, with root privileges, which is really bad in one way, but for, for the moment they didn't figure it out or they have a non-root mode as well, but it's in the experimental mode and it doesn't really work with all the features that they are um, expecting. Okay, now we're getting a bit more on the orchestration. So you have all those containers, but somehow you want to administer them all from only one place. So we have here the, how like the um, uh, Kubernetes works. We have a master and then the master has some nodes which he has to um, delegate to spread the, uh, containers to, towards those nodes. So as I will start a bit with the master. 
So the master has an um, API server, which the API server controls everything. So you, all the communication will go uh, through the API server. It also has like a scheduler, which is really important because it will look at the resources that you have on the node, and then it will split like uh, based on your resources, it will split the um, the load. The control manager takes care of everything, like creating the pods, uh, deploying them, and so on. And another important thing there is the etcd database, which contains all the um, information about your cluster, and also it contains all your sensitive data. So it, it has this, like the password, the configuration, the, um, everything there. Now we're going a bit on the um, nodes, which is uh, to explain a bit the uh, parts there. So what is really important is have the, like the Kubelet service. It just communicates with the API server. So every, all the commands that the um, master server will give will go through the Kubelet server. Whatever, like, okay, deploy this pod, it will go there and just will just deploy. And um, the kube prox is the one which is like taking care of the networking and it's uh, forwarding all the ports, what is needed in such a way that the uh, containers can communicate with them. Now I want to speak about, not too much about the Kubernetes object because we will see later that we really need those. So um, a pod is, um, a, is grouping like um, a set of containers uh, in a, ha using the same, um, the same net or the same storage and, and so on. But um, to have this pod, you need a service where you define on how to, uh, how, what do you want from that pad, a pod, and you also want to a deployment which will say, okay, I need it to be in a certain state, so I'll just deploy it there. The thing is, uh, all those objects are really important the moment when it creates, because you will see at a certain point the flow, it will help you somehow look onto your like infrastructures to see how to look for the guys, if, if someone is trying to do something to be able to understand the, the flow. Okay, we're getting to, We've seen that Kubernetes has a, a lot of like um, many parties, I would say, like API server. You need also to um, the kubelets on the nodes and also the, the, the ETC data store. What is really bad about the, in, now for the configuration that you have on the API server, it allows you anonymous access and you have those parameters which you can use. Well, this will open the, the world to everyone. Like, if you have those and someone will scan it, you just get it there and that's it, that's done. It's the same, the same thing for the Kubelet, which will communicate with the um, Kube API server. By default, there's no authentication or authorization by default. Well, there's one way to, at least to help this one, is like not exposing those APIs and if you really need those, then use use the TLS aut authentication. Like it's it's really it's really important. And now we're getting to the etc data store, which, as I told you, it's it's the database which holds all the information about their cluster. So it holds all the secrets and everything. So if if someone gets to it, like it has everything. It it does it doesn't even matter. So be sure that you will only um, give access to the API server and Secure it with certificates, and also there's now there's a possibility to encrypt some uh, resources in the in the database. So it's it's really important to take care of at least those uh, bare minimum um, to have a um, sort of protection, I would say. Okay, so the pod security it's somehow the same thing as with the security of the containers. So for sure you want to. Uh, a, a policy for those uh, pods that no one will have like root access, there won't be any privileges on it. There, there, like you won't open the door to everyone. We just give like specific access to who needs it in, in the end. Okay, now I'll hand the floor to Emilia. Okay, thanks, Yona. Um, so Yona explained very important things, especially, she said several times, do not expose API to everybody. And I will explain a bit why. Okay, but before that, uh, I mean, 
A lot of interesting thing is when you think about attack about containers, a lot of people will think about, okay, which vulnerability? Can I jump uh, from a container to the host? So you had uh, dozens of different vulnerability, but uh, those three kind of represent the type of vulnerability you will see. I think the most important one was your CV 2019-5736 on RNC, uh, especially because it was not only affecting Docker or Kubernetes, it was affecting almost all of the container software because everybody was relying on Rancy uh, to do uh, to do parts of the job. Uh, the thing is it was pretty easy to if you are able to actually execute command on a container to jump to the host and then boom you're root because yeah why not running is that root. Um, so Docker for Windows had a very interesting one. You were actually able to generate a malicious image and if somebody actually import the image in Docker uh, you can actually execute command on the root. So it was quite interesting because it needs to involve a bit of social engineering to kind of say to people, hey, yeah, I have this nice program just running on your Docker because it's amazing and yeah, then you get it. <laughs> and finally, the last one was very funny. It's not affecting Docker Kubernetes, it's uh, affecting RKT. Sorry. Uh, because in this case, what you need to do is to actually convince the administrator of the Docker to do an exec command uh, on your container. So what you do is you will actually put a trap in one of the traditionally used uh, executable. Let's say if the, if the administrator wants to run something, he will try to run, I don't know, uh, bash, for example. So you put a trap, so you modify the executable, and actually it will trigger execution on the host. Say, so, okay, that's fancy. It requires a lot of social engineering in some cases, but actually I'm not sure that's the most needed because APIs. So. Why would you expose API on internet? Uh, I don't know, but apparently a lot of people are doing it. And it's really easy to abuse because by design, Docker at least, and was not designed to be a production tool, I think. I think it was something which was designed initially to help developers to deploy test environments and to be able to execute some script and stuff like that. But it was so powerful and easy to use that people started using it in production. So the different default configuration are crap. And uh, especially you will see that a lot of people actually put those stuff online. Uh, so first type of abuse, running a command in a container. So there you have an example with Kubelet, uh, which is one of the API deployed by Kubernetes. Um, so it's pretty easy. You basically, you do three commands. First, you actually get the list of running containers. So you just make a get request to the slash pod API endpoint. And then you get a nice JSON file with all the information you need. From there, you extract the information, especially the namespace, the pod name, and the container name. And then you can just run a post command uh, with the actual command you want to do. Like, I don't know uh, who am I or ID to see, I mean, quite what kind of privilege you have. And then that's where it gets interesting. You need to actually do another get command, but with a SPDI capable client, which is deprecated since some years, but they are still using it because... Why not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, the, it, it tells you exactly what, uh, I mean, if it works, let it run. Uh, I mean, the psychology is there, is there, and so, yeah. But actually, there is something way, way more interesting. Um, okay, so basically you say, okay, I, I like crypto mining, I like cryptocurrencies, so what can you do with that? First things, you go to Docker Hub, which is uh, hosted by Docker. Uh, you create a nice repository, uh, I don't know, let's call it like uh, super advanced uh, threat intelligence feed uh, <laughs> repository, and you upload a nice image, uh, let's say a basic Debian, and you add some nice crypto mining tool like XMRIC. Then you do some magic and then you get profit. So let's speak about, about magic. Okay. So if uh, Docker exposes API, so port uh, 2375 or 2376 over SSL, uh, actually what you can do is just send a command, a post command to the, through the API and ask Docker to deploy an image. If locally the image is not already there, it will by default go to Docker Hub and download the image and then run it. So you do not even need to write a very fancy Python script. You just have to use the Docker clients and just ask him, okay, please run this Emilian slash onk um, 
image that you do not have in your local repository and just run it and if uh, everybody uh, if it's killed, restart it immediately. And so this image is actually, uh, let's say, a XM rig image. And so you start crypto mining and job's done. But it gets better. So as Johanna explained, uh, Docker by design is running as root. Uh, that's the way it works. So if you actually have access to the Docker API, when you mount an image and you start a container, you can just ask him to mount a local folder from the host. That's something you do as an admin. I mean, if you have a container which is already running, you cannot easily tell him, okay, just go to this host, um, I mean, uh, folder and get me the list. But if you start the container yourself, then you can do it. So it's in, in this example, it's not really visible. Uh, but what I do, I just go there. I just tell him to download the Ubuntu image from Docker Hub, run it, and then mount slash etc in slash TMP. Okay, so I got Joe, so then I ask him to run a bash, so I have a remote shell on my container, and I just can read the shadow file from the host. So you can imagine the type of attacks you can do. Imagine you have your Docker running in the same server as your Kubernetes, okay? So it means that you can actually access all those very sensitive files like the etcd and all those stuff as root. That's the way it works. That's amazing. Okay, so uh, I think some kind of attacks that we can see being used uh, online. So now what uh, we did is to actually try to figure out uh, what kind of stuff are running on um, unsecure Docker or Kubernetes server online. So to do that, we wrote a bunch of scripts, uh, very well written scripts, uh, to actually go with four steps. The first one is to identify um, open API on Docker and Kubelet. So to do that, we just went lazy and we used services like Shodan and Onif in order to get a list of uh, existing Docker server online or existing Kubernetes server online. So we have a nice list with open ports. So then we just do get requests through the API endpoints to get the list of running containers. So if you're on Docker, you just do a get on slash container slash JSON and you get a nice list. Uh, if you are against Kubelet, uh, you do a slash pod and then you, you get the list. Uh, there is other API that um, uh, Johanna explained a bit that uh, we, we, we plan to actually integrate into the process. But just with that, we got a list something like uh, 10,000 uh, different uh, exposed servers online. Interesting. Um, okay, so now we extract information from those uh, downloaded stuff, and I'm also, we are mostly interested by two information. The first one is a running command line. So when you get the list, if you do a Docker LS, for example, with a Docker client, you get the list of containers and the actual command, which is executed when it starts. And the other thing you get is actually the image tag that is loaded, like this slash Emilia Onk that I did in my example. Uh, so what we do is we, we actually uh, get those stuff and in case of we are running images, we can actually download it. Either from Docker Hub, if it's on Docker Hub, or directly we can do a pull request and ask to download the base image from the Kubernetes server, from the Docker uh, server. Uh, and then we will analyze what's in it and I will speak a bit more about how we do that later. Okay, so what did we found? Uh, there I will mostly start by speaking about these running command lines. Let's say the classic, that's very easy. Most of the cases we found, I would say 99% is crypto mining. Because I mean, that's easy. When you actually compromise uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, interface, you can do two stuff. Uh, or you encrypt stuff, or you use a CPU to do crypto mining. But today run somewhere it's not as popular as before, so everybody is doing crypto mining. Uh, so in those cases is actually if you already did incident response on a compromised uh, server with crypto mining, you will recognize the command lines. So you have the Stratum protocol, so it's mostly mining uh, Monero cryptocurrency, and you have the, the wallet address of the people doing the, um, the mining. And in some cases, they try to impersonate very poorly uh, other processes like Nginx uh, or even Docker D for the last example. Yeah, sure. It looks legit. Uh, but you have smarter people, uh, which actually do all the stuff. Uh, so this one, I call it the Fortitudes, uh, because it's mostly targeting Alibaba. 
so mostly server in China, uh, and especially in Alibaba cloud services. So it's actually, the command line it's doing is uh, downloading a script and put it in a cron job to be sure that it's executed on a regular basis if somebody starts to do a cleaning. So the first thing it's doing is create a cron job and remove all type of logs to try to poorly hide um, its footprint. Then it will download another script, which is hosted in Hong Kong, but I will not do any attribution. And uh, then it starts doing something very, very interesting. It actually use chatter command line to remove the immutability of some task in the server. And then it will download through so this URL a nice script. So this script is actually a script provided by Alibaba for people which want to remove monitoring on the virtual machine is that you deploy in Alibaba cloud services. So that's why I think it's really targeted because in part of the process, they will really target monitoring stuff and especially monitoring stuff deployed by Alibaba cloud services. It also contain a lot of kill command in order to kill other type of process like sysguard, log rotate, and trying to remove a lot of cron tasks that is not interested because at the end it's deploying XMRIG again. <laughs> Uh, this one is um, very in interesting as well. Um, okay, so first thing, the initial command that you can see uh, is actually uh, doing a serial shoot and then doing a useless curl command on the PHP file, which is just, you know, pushing in dev null. So I think it's used by the threat actor to do monitoring, uh, to see how many people do get requests on this specific uh, URL. So we probably just look at the logs because there is nothing there. And then it's downloading a script uh, and executing it. So the script is huge. I uh, don't know, 800 lines or something like that. So first thing is do is create a user called Darmok, okay? Put it in the suders group giving it a lot of write on everything, and it just remove all authorized SSH key, put it on, okay? Kill SSH, and restart it on port 78. So the thing is, he really wants to be the only one on the server, okay? He kind of uh, tried to kick everybody else. Because the next thing he's doing, and that's something that we've seen a lot uh, on Windows or Linux uh, crypto mining uh, botnet, is to actually kill all competition. So you have this nice script or from almost 450 lines uh, when it will actually look for processes with specific keywords and kill them. And in the specific keywords, you have stuff very, very specific, like wallet addresses, IP addresses, um, strange GPIG file name. So it's interesting because those in the crypto mining botnet world, people are doing their threat intelligence, okay? And they actually uh, keep track of those stuff. Okay, we'll have to accelerate because uh, you want to have some of the 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. okay. Uh, and the last thing he's doing is deploying uh, a Python backdoor. Okay, so now I will speak quickly about the Docker image structure because as I explained, we download a lot of uh, Docker image and we want to analyze them. So you have uh, config files and you have the different layers which are the different uh, added uh, stuff into your uh, base image. And so you can actually pass those JSON to get a kind of history of what was done, okay? And then you have the tar file which is actually the file which was added to the, to the base image. Uh, so to analyze it, I, I highly recommend if you want to analyze something to use Dive, which is an amazing tool. But it's an amazing tool to analyze one image. So the thing we had to do, because we had 1,246 images to analyze, uh, is to actually we wrote some Python script in order to automate the process and detect interesting images. Uh, the script will be available on GitHub. I was trying to do it this morning, but yeah. Anyway, do not expect perfectly written code, but it kind of works, so that's fine. <laughs> So we found several uh, malicious repositories. So this one is very basic. Uh, so this guy had small success, 7,500 downloads that you can see on Docker Hub. And it's actually just a basic crypto miner. And when he actually push uh, stuff to the API, just ask with uh, the configuration. Uh, that's a screenshot of some Chinese forum where people are complaining about uh, CPU usage on the Docker server. <laughs> Um, so this one is slightly more advanced because it's doing a very, very advanced technique, which is to rename XMRig. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if it was very successful. I mean, there are more than 150,000 downloads, but they actually got banned from the mining pools they were using. 
And finally, this one is really cool. Uh, so this one are 1,500 million downloads. It's still running. Um, I will get in touch with Docker Hub uh, in order to maybe kick them out. Uh, and the thing is, it's actually running Docker in Docker. So the first image is containing Docker, and then it's downloading the song of the image to actually do the crypto mining. And I see them actually using a cron job, and they also use a private pool, uh, so you cannot really know how much um, uh, cryptocurrency they mined. Uh, but uh, in some cases, they will also compromise the host to be sure that if it's killed, it will be spawned again through a cron job. And I think those ones are very, very, um, very successful. Okay. Okay, let's go back to, uh, we've seen that Emilian can do uh, really malicious stuff. The, I presented earlier on the uh, how to secure our environment, but also you'd like to monitor it in the end. So we have to really know what logs we need to, to, to grab in order to be able to, to monitor those environments. So what is really important for the Docker is to look for the demo logs. Those are really important because if you have your uh, remote API enabled, you can see all the calls that are made there. Like it's really important to take that one to be able to, to track uh, if uh, someone is coming uh, in through your network. Also the container logs give you like all the um, commands that were executed and all the output that is there. Well, the Kubernetes became a bit more complicated. There are like, as uh, Sad mentioned yesterday, there are layers on layers and layers. So they have so many logs that sometimes you almost get log, uh, lost in it. But it's important to focus on the container logs, which uh, give you the exactly uh, what's happening inside and also on the uh, cluster components logs like between the um, API um, server, the scheduler, the the, guy, uh, the guys who are doing like you know the controlling the infrastructure there, and also what's really really important to have enabled audit logs. By default, they're not enabled, and I'll show you how useful they are when uh, you look after um, um, after bad things happening in your network. Okay, so what we've done here. We collected those log in an elastic search. We used like um, Fluendi, which is a log ship uh, log shipper to um, to gra to grab all the Kubernetes logs. And also for for the Docker, we had the, we used Bits, um, which are like light shipper um, um, for um, for the specific logs. So we will take like for example, we'll take the logs from the um, journal B, like uh, which are from the journal D. Um, from the file bit, we're taking exactly the logs from the um, containers. And uh, on the metric bits, for example, we're, t we're looking for specific fields like container ID, uh, the container commands that it has, the uh, process executable, the process arguments, which is really important, we'll see in a second. And for the Fluent, which is the, um, we use it for the Kubernetes, we're taking, again, the container, the cluster logging, and yeah, which contains also the audit logs and everything. Okay, so we've seen that we have a lot of, like, logs. And humanly, it's kind of impossible to look after them. It's like, yeah, you have 10 times, uh, 10 types of logs, and you have to look at them. So we found this really nice tool which monitors your containers. It works on the um, system calls level, and you can, like, it looks at all your processes, and based on the um, rules that you created, it can trigger alerts. Like, for example, if someone executes a container you didn't expect it to be executed, it will just pop an alert. So we worked with this, and based on the alerts that we had, then we start looking into, into the logs. So, Emilian showed this is yeah, not really visible, looks like. But uh, what I'm showing here is that Emilian is mounting um, a container with, uh, with uh, root privileges, and it manages to mount everything. So we'll have this um, notice that, um, well, it was a container was mounted with sensitive uh, uh, with a sensitive mount. So mm, that. That's not really okay, you know, that's, if you mount uh, something uh, which is really important, then might be, uh, to the, might go to the root one. So here, oh, it's really bad on how it is, but you have to focus on, um, we're looking here on the logs that are from the daemon logs. So ignore all the like, yeah, there are, it's a lot of log there, but you have to look for specific words. Like for example, when Emilia got, um, got the, the image, 
you can see in the log, if you look there, it's calling post, images create, and trying to pull image from somewhere. So if you look after those, you can see that someone tried to download it from, from, uh, from the internet. And also, what is really important to look after the um, containers is, is to look if someone created one. So for example, if you look at containers create, that should trigger you an alert. This, this shouldn't happen. Like if, if you didn't uh, do it, then this sh uh, shouldn't happen. Also, you have to look like uh, words like attach or exec. That's the moment when someone connects to one of your containers and yeah, can do um, uh, whatever in your container. What, as I emphasized before, if you established pretty well the, the security layers, and you mounted your uh, images as uh, um, read-only, people shouldn't be able to do it. But in case you didn't, you, could, you are able to, to track it this way, looking into the uh, daemon logs. Also, you have, as I said, the Docker container logs, where you can see all the uh, commands that um, um, Emilien executed before. So he's the bad guy here. And as you can see, I can see what he, what commands he issued and what is the, what is the output. So it's a good track to see, to, to see what happened in your environment. Also, you can look into, into other, like, um, into other logs, like, um, in the host system logs where you will find, like, um, how, um, what commands have been issued, like bin bash, he connected, he opened the shell and, uh, you can see also like the, um, the container ID and also for how long uh, uh, the container has been up, uh, up and running. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, I'll try to go fast. This is an example of a miner that uh, it was started. So we're grabbing, we created the special rules, for example, if uh, um, the, um, if it runs on specific ports and it has specific arguments, like uh, Emilian showed that you can uh, change from XMRIG to something else. Well, I create, we created the rule when we, you are able to look on the arguments and not on the, um, on the process uh, itself. Okay, this is, uh, okay. So we have an example here, like the same example with the miner, but looking into the, um, Kubernetes, is like how it works. So what is happening here? Like it's uh, creating um, um, a, a miner from um, um, one of the nodes that we're having. So Emilien uh, went to the one of the nodes. He issued like insecure TLS verify, and it looked like he was able to do it, not even having a password. He just managed to to do it. And now. I want to see if I can track him, if I can look on, on some logs. Okay, this is, um, see the importance of the audit logs? It's like, if you don't have those, you won't be able to see much. Like, uh, if you look down on the cluster logs, you'll have this like, successful created, created pod. But you won't know who did it, how it happened, and so on. So, having the uh, audit logs, you, you are able to track it. So here you will see like, uh, you're able to um, see that it was um, created um, a new pod, and you can see it, it It was, you have there on the containers, you can see exactly with the parameters that, uh, that um, it was um, uh, created. Like we have here clearly, we can see the image, the uh, minor image, and all the parameters they were giving. Okay, here are more uh, audit logs, but this is the, the the whole process of showing like um, it shows on how it successfully managed to take the image from the internet and creating the container. So in the end, it created the container, and now we have here down there like the containers logs, which you can see exactly what happened into the into the container. So. It looks like it opened this uh, pool. It gave it a, what CPU to use, and in the end, like you will see, you got a new job, which means like um, Emilian started miner, mining. <laughs> and if you have a look, if you monitor your CPU and so on, you'll just clearly see that um, um, it, it got a bit to 100 percent, a bit. So he <laughs> okay, conclusion. Um, it, it was said several times uh, already in this conference. Uh, it's nice to have new tools, to have new technology, and 
A lot of people focus on how easy it is to deploy stuff because it's money. You need less people to actually do the deployment, do the maintenance of it, and to actually develop new technology. But have you seen it's a mess? It's not necessarily secure by design. So the, the, the risk there is uh, we should focus to uh, adopting technology which do not only lower the load for deploying and managing, but also for securing. But have you seen, I, I don't know how many type of logs there is, maybe we even missed some. And the thing is, if you need to have 10 times more security engineer, security analyst, um, forensics expert, in order to maintain your uh, environment, maybe you should think about stopping adding more layers of crap on top of each other. Um, <laughs> So I have nothing against Docker technology, but I would have loved if it would have been, let's say, designed securely from the start. Instead of needed people to go to conference and explain how easy it is to compromise them. You know? Would have been great. Oh, and please stop exposing API to internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Questions? Okay. Any uh, questions here in the room? Yeah. Hello. I have a question, absolutely not technical. How much people do you have in your team who fight or protect the Europa? Sorry, can you repeat it? Uh, how much people are you in your team who is in charge of the CERT EU? So I suppose that you are fighting for us, for the European Union, um, defending it? Okay. <laughs> okay, maybe I should have done an introduction about CERT EU. Um, CERT EU is a set of European institutions, bodies, and agencies. Our constituents are the European institutions. It's not the Europe. So do not tell uh, CERT Bund or NC that we are the European CERT. They may not like it. Um, so we are 30 people, and our job is to support incident response and, I mean, security hygiene uh, for constituents. So. Okay. Any further questions in the room? Thanks for the nice presentation. Uh, how did you detect the malicious Docker images? Because you showed a couple which you found on the uh, hub. Uh, what was your strategy? Ah, you mean to the, find the, them? The, the malicious images on Docker Hub? Yes. Okay. I downloaded. Uh, I, I explained there. Uh, so the way we did that is yeah there. So I looked at every container. I was seeing running online. So I was actually abusing the API of unsecure uh, Docker server or Kubelet's uh, API. Once you get the list, you have the name of the image. And actually the name of the image in most cases is actually uh, a repository name, which in this case is Tanchao 2014. And then you have the name of the image. So if you know the name of the image, you can actually download it load it in your Docker uh, server, or you can actually use some script to impersonate the Docker server to download just the TAR, I mean the, the compressed archive, and then we wrote some script to actually uh, analyze it and look for strange stuff, like uh, renaming of binaries or a specific um, parameter used in uh, mining command lines or uh, heavy use of curl and wget query. And especially in the same command line, like if wget is not installed, use curl, which is something heavily used by uh, by malicious attack or compromising the style of server. So yeah, I mean anybody can do it. It's uh, it's it's really it's really open for now. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any further questions? Yeah. that. Hello. First of all, thank you for the talk. It's uh, been very interesting. I have basically two questions. Uh, the first is, since you were looking for Docker, Kubernetes, and so on, um, did you also encounter some OpenShift installations? Um, yes, we've seen some, uh, but we did not script it yet 
to look more in details what's happening there. Uh, I also, uh, we also found some RKT uh, servers, and I'm really, really interested by uh, AWS Lambda, okay. which actually I think will make things worse. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, second question, um, you mentioned that you were searching for those installations online through Shodan.io and so on. Um, would you mind sharing the docs you've used for searching the containers? Uh, you mean the, the, the query or the yeah, list of... Yeah, the uh, query. Yeah, just ping me and I can share that. There is yeah. absolutely, Great, thank absolutely no problem. Yeah. I, I may actually push the lists. I mean, all the JSON I don't know that I may actually push them to GitHub uh, later. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, it could be useful for searching them. <laughs> thanks. I think there was one more question somewhere in the room where I can't... Okay. Um, the other thing you should know, apparently, before trusting anything these people do, apparently we discovered in the PowerPoint karaoke yesterday that it's an office of sociopaths. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, you might want to bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.